Chapter 152, Back to Night Eye Agency Looking after a child was hard as heck. Yuta's respect for his grandma increased tenfold, and Rika was among the best of the children. She hardly cried or demanded anything outrageous. But more than anything, he was sure that even if she did, he couldn't get angry at her. She was just too cute. Last night, he had come back to his house with something good for the little girl to eat, and then fell asleep directly. He had no idea what he would do from tomorrow. He had to go to the Night Eye Agency, and being the only one able to see, hear, or touch Rika, he had to bring her with him. This was another reason why he wasn't too worried about her safety. No one else could directly touch her. But the downside was that he almost always had to accompany her around. Sigh. Yuta groggily woke up, and the first thing he noticed was that he wasn't in his extra soft bed, which he had paid three times as much for, just to get good sleep. In fact, he was sleeping on the sofa. He had given the bed to Rika, so why was she sleeping on top of him? Yuta looked at the small girl sleeping on top of him, making him feel suffocated. For some reason, she didn't seem that small anymore. I didn't give away that bed for you to sleep on top of me, you know? Yuta couldn't help but sigh. Good morning, Yuta. The girl sleeping soundly on top of him suddenly twitched and rubbed her eyes cutely. You're up. Mind telling me why you left the bed? Yuta asked with a slightly helpless tone. I want to sleep with Yuta. Rika immediately replied with a big smile on her face, making Yuta's smile stiffen. Good thing I'm the only one who can hear her. Otherwise, I'd have been behind bars for being a lollicon by now. Yuta almost rolled his eyes and got up while picking up the girl. Then suddenly he felt something. She was heavier than yesterday. Yuta wondered whether he was just imagining it, but this was the second day he had felt this way. And then there was also her behavior. Now she was completely able to talk. For a five-year-old, not being able to speak is strange on its own, but her being able to do it in just a few days? Or maybe she was always able to speak but didn't because she was still afraid and shy. It's possible. Still, Yuta measured her height and weight for good measure. It was important to know whether she was in good health or not. He himself didn't know anything about raising a child, and though he wasn't planning on raising one, until he figured out what the deal was with Rika and why she was the way she was, he had to keep her by his side. So he remembered to pick up some books on child-rearing when he went to the Night Eye Agency. Come on, Rika. I'm making noodles today. Did you brush your teeth? Yuta asked while preparing the food. Yup. Rika happily climbed up to the chair, ready to devour the noodles. Yuta watched this adorable scene with a smile on his face. Going to the Night Eye Agency was a dull affair. It was boring, but it did give Yuta enough time to read the data Night Eye had sent him about a missing child he had asked about. He was disappointed. Even after knowing the name of the person he was looking for, he couldn't find any information on her. There was no missing girl recently who looked like her or was named Rika. It's most likely that she was raised by her parents and then her quirk awakened, making her invisible. Somehow, she got separated from her parents. Yuta had a headache. If things continued like this, he might have to keep her with him forever. After all, others couldn't see her, touch her, or hear her. Slowly, his eyes drifted to the girl playing with a little game he had picked up for her while coming here. He had a strange feeling that he knew her, that he had seen her somewhere before and even heard that name. It's just that he couldn't remember much. Much of his childhood memories were blurry after he hit his head from falling. Suddenly, his eyes widened. Rika. He looked at the girl again, trying to remember that one girl. But he couldn't. His memories were hazy. Hmm. Maybe I can check out my old photo album. Grandma should have it with her things, right? Luckily, like every other grandmother, she had decided to capture every second of her grandson's childhood in photos. There's gotta be an image of my childhood friends in there, right? Yuta suddenly smiled as he thought about his grandma. He really respected that woman from the bottom of his heart. Chapter 153, Back to Night Eye's Agency 2 Yuta sat across from Night Eye in his office. The situation was pretty awkward. Night Eye's piercing gaze seemed to look right through him, analyzing every movement, every breath. Yuta shifted slightly in his seat, feeling that he should have just stayed away, 
It wasn't like the information from Night Eye had helped him at all. I'll get straight to the point, Night Eye began, knowing that Yuta's concentration could be as fleeting as a goldfish if he wasn't interested. From their last meeting, he had learned enough about Yuta to use that knowledge. I believe you have the potential to be the next symbol of peace. You've already proven your strength by defeating All for One, something even All Might struggled with. But raw power isn't enough. You should have seen the kind of destruction your last attack caused. You need guidance, training, someone to help you hone your abilities. Night Eye was intently watching Yuta. Yuta couldn't help but feel a pang of doubt. The idea of replacing All Might was intriguing, but if it meant he had to rush after every single villain in the city, he wasn't sure he wanted that. After all, he had become a hero not because he wanted to be one, but because it was the only way to get stronger with his system and train himself. Being a hero was still a hobby at best. After all, who doesn't like showing off their power? I appreciate the compliment, but, Yuta hesitated, I'm not sure I'm ready for something like that. I'm not sure I'm cut out for the spotlight. Yuta wasn't sure what Night Eye was getting at, but he didn't like it at all. So the best way to approach this situation seemed to be to express his reluctance from the very start. Night Eye leaned back, his eyes narrowing slightly. No one is born ready, kid. They all train themselves to be in front of the camera. Night Eye replied, not looking at Yuta, but rather at All Might's picture on the wall, as if reminiscing about the old days. I can see the future, you know that, right? He asked. Yuta nodded. But I can't see your future. Do you understand what that means? You have the ability to change the future, to create a world where peace is more than just a fleeting moment. Do you understand what kind of potential that is? Night Eye's reply made Yuta purse his lips. That's why I want you to train under me, to become my sidekick for the time being. Let me tell you, sooner or later, the world will demand you be the hero you've shown them you could be. Even if you want to, there is no going back to being that hero trainee student. I can help you develop the skills you'll need to lead, to inspire, and to protect. Yuta hesitated, finally understanding where he was going with this. He knew that sooner or later, that would happen. His provisional hero license was enough to understand what the government was thinking. With All Might's recent retirement, there was enough pressure for others to push him into the spotlight. He wasn't sure what to do anymore. Let alone becoming a superhero celebrity, he wasn't even sure he was cut out for a normal hero life. Now people wanted him to go full-time. And that's not all. He couldn't always stay in this world either, and being tied down with this job would be troublesome. I don't want to disappoint you, Yuta began slowly, choosing his words carefully. But I'm not sure I'm the right person for this. I'm still trying to figure out what kind of hero I want to be. I'm not even sure I want to be a hero like All Might. I respect what he's done, but I think I need to find my own path. I'm more like the friendly neighborhood hero than the number one hero. That number one position is just too much. I can fight the villains, that's fine, but... Yuta thought and thought again, but upon not knowing what to say anymore, he just stopped, hoping Night Eye would pick up on the fact that he wasn't interested. Night Eye's expression remained the same. I understand your hesitation, but before you decide anything, hear this. Night Eye swiveled in his chair and switched Ed on the TV in his office. You don't become a hero to get recognized. Rather, you can only become a true hero when people recognize you. That's what he told me. I pondered hard over this, and no matter how many times I tried to counter his argument, I couldn't. I thought my path was right, but he, with just his words, crushed me from following that path so I'm no longer the hero killer. Hero killer Stain is long dead. At that point, Night Eye paused the video and looked back at Yuta. Yuta, on the other hand, noticed that the video started from a particular timestamp, not from the beginning where Stain started speaking. This bastard set that video up just to show me. Can he really not see my future, or is he joking? Using my own words against me. Yuta barely managed to stop his eyebrows from twitching. You have influenced many people, not just normal civilians, but even a ruthless villain like the hero killer was changed. You didn't just stop him, but also changed what he was. No ordinary person can do that, you know. 
You might not recognize yourself as a hero, but what about the people? Your words, not mine. They recognize you. You can't run away from this. Night Eye looked at Yuda, applying psychological pressure. Yuda put his mind into overdrive, trying to come up with a reply to his own hero talk from back then. But before he could say anything, Night Eye spoke again. The path you choose doesn't have to be the same as All Might's. You can be your own kind of hero. My offer isn't about turning you into someone you're not. It's about helping you become the best version of yourself. Yuda looked down at his hands, his mind racing. Think, think, come up with something. He didn't want to reject Night Eye outright, but he also didn't want to commit to something he wasn't fully sure of. I really appreciate what you're offering, but I think I need some time to think about it. This is a big decision, and I don't want to rush into something without being sure. Night Eye nodded, though Yuda could sense a hint of a smirk forming on his face. I understand. Take the time you need to make your decision. Just know that my offer stands, and I believe in your potential. When you're ready, I'll be here. Yuda gave a small nod and quickly stood up, ready to leave, but Night Eye's voice stopped him before he reached the door. Yuta, Night Eye said, his tone softer now. Whatever you decide, just remember this. With great power comes. Don't you dare complete that sentence. Chapter 154 Chapter 154 Patrol Yuta walked alongside Mirio and Izuku through the bustling city streets. It was just another routine patrol, one of many he had been doing since joining Night Eye's agency. To say he was bored would be an understatement. The thrill of battle and the intensity of real missions seemed like a distant memory as he wandered the city aimlessly, watching for any signs of trouble. It's strange, but he wasn't getting any missions besides that side mission. But only now did he remember what was going on with this system. After killing AFO, he got the notification that he wouldn't be getting any more missions in his world. Maybe that was the reason he was only getting a side mission here. Possibly, he has to wait and see to be sure. Mirio was his usual cheerful self, chatting away with Izuku about various hero-related topics. Izuku, on the other hand, was listening intently, soaking up every bit of wisdom Mirio had to offer. Both are nerds of the highest caliber when it comes to heroes. Yuta remembers being somewhat like them with Marvel in his previous world, and then the multiverse happened and feminization took over. His thoughts drifted back to Rika, whom he had left in his room at the agency. He knew she was safe there, but he couldn't help but feel a bit guilty for leaving her behind, even if it was just for a short time. He was right when he thought that the girl was growing up much faster than anticipated. In a few days, she looked like she was already a seven- or eight-year-old girl and not a five-year-old. Her height had increased, her weight had increased, and more than anything, she was getting more mature. He had read enough books and surfed the net to know that this wasn't normal. He couldn't even get her checked by a doctor. Others neither could see her nor touch her. Honestly, he was a little worried, but he couldn't do anything for the time being. One good thing was that she wasn't showing any particular sign of being sick. To pass the time, Yuta decided to join the conversation. So, what do you guys usually do on these patrols? He asked, trying to sound engaged. Mostly just keep an eye out for anything suspicious, Mirio replied with a grin. It's more about being present and reassuring the public that heroes are around. It's not always action-packed, but it's important work. By the way, why are you wearing that? Mirio asked with a little confusion. Yuta wasn't wearing his usual hero costume, which was pretty much a rip-off of Yuta Okatsu's uniform in JJK. Like the other two, he wasn't in his hero costume. Rather, he was wearing a green tracksuit, and to top it off, he was also wearing a mask like he was sick. Usually in Japan, people wear that only when they are sick, covering his lower face. I don't want people to know who I am, Yuta replied with a slightly annoyed tone. He couldn't help but sigh at his situation when he went out nowadays. Izuku nodded in agreement. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yuta sighed inwardly. It wasn't that he didn't appreciate the importance of these tasks. He just craved something more challenging. Still, he knew this was part of being a hero too, so he tried to make the best of it. As they walked, Izuku suddenly stopped in his tracks, his eyes widening as he focused on something ahead. Hey, look at that, he whispered 
pointing towards a small girl standing a little way down the street. She had a tiny horn on her head and a frightened look in her eyes. Yuta and Mirio were a bit further back, but they quickly caught up with Izuku. By the time they arrived, Izuku was already talking to the girl. Yuta's eyes scanned the scene, noting the man who had just come after the girl. The man had a strange mask on his face, and he seemed to be watching Izuku and the girl intently. Who's that? Yuta asked quietly, more to himself than anyone else. He racked his brain, trying to place the man. The mask on his face seemed familiar, but he couldn't recall where he had seen it before. Yuta frowned slightly. Apparently, he knew who this person was, but he didn't say, so Yuta didn't ask. Yuta's instincts told him to stay calm. So far, there wasn't anything overtly threatening about the situation. The man could be anyone, just another citizen with a quirk that required some kind of mask or prompt. He couldn't go around punching people just because someone looked like a villain. And the girl, she was almost the age of Rika and looked scared, but there were plenty of reasons why a child might be frightened in a busy city. So Yuta decided to rely on his spider sense. Sensing nothing wrong, he didn't take any action. Should we do something? Izuku whispered, glancing back at his companions. Come on, there is still a lot of area to cover, Mirio replied, keeping his voice steady but with a hint of caution in his tone. Izuku maybe sensed that and nodded, though he looked uneasy. The girl was clearly in distress, and Izuku's protective instincts were kicking in. Yuta, on the other hand, just stayed silent. He only wanted to reach out to her after seeing the girl. She was just like Rika, and though he had met Rika not that long ago, he was getting attached to the girl. So seeing a girl like her so scared kind of made him feel strange. But ultimately, there was nothing urging him to take action. The man with the mark on his face stepped forward, placing a hand gently on the girl's shoulder. Come on, Eri, it's time to go, he said in a calm, soothing voice. Eri! Yuta repeated the name under his breath, trying to see if it triggered any memories. But there was nothing. The girl hesitated for a moment, before reluctantly nodding and allowing herself to be led away. As they watched the man and the girl disappear into the crowd, Yuta's mind was still racing. There was something about the whole encounter that didn't sit right with him, but he couldn't put his finger on it. Do you think we should have done something? Izuku asked again. His voice tinged with guilt. Mirio shook his head. This is not the time to talk about it. We are going back. We need to report this to Sir Nidai. At this, Yuta finally reacted. Report what? Do you know that man? Yuta asked, already having a bad feeling. To which Mirio just gave Yuta a look that made him even more sure that trouble was coming. Chapter 155 Hero Meeting 1 In the brightly lit meeting room of Nidai's agency, several heroes had gathered around a large table, the air thick with tension. Among those present were Mirio, Izuku, Yuta, Ryukyu, Fat Gum, and a few others who had been specially invited for this meeting. The mood was somber. Everyone knew they were about to discuss something serious. Nidai stood at the head of the table. He placed a stack of documents on the table, each one containing vital information about the topic they were about to discuss. Thank you all for coming, he began. We have a critical situation on our hands that requires our immediate attention. As some of you may be aware, Nidai continued, there has been a disturbing rise in the use of a quirk-suppressing drug among villains. This drug has been traced back to a single source, the Shi Hasaikai, an underground criminal organization led by a man named Kai Chisaki, also known as Overhaul. Nidai paused for a moment, letting the gravity of his words sink in. There was a murmur of concern from the heroes, and Fat Gum clenched his fists, his usually cheerful demeanor darkening. Yes, we ran into a villain who used those drugs, and they are not just quirk-suppressing drugs, but also enhancement drugs as well, Fat Gum added, covering a bit of the information that Night Eye had missed. Yuta, on the other hand, wasn't sure what to do. He couldn't remember a plot like this. Surely he hadn't seen this coming. Right now, he could only curse internally for not having watched the entire anime before he died. After coming back to the agency and reporting to Night Eye, he realized what had just happened. For the first time, he realized that being a little nerd about heroes and villains might be useful. Both Mirio and Deku knew who that person was. He was the only one who didn't. 
If he had known, he would have long beaten the crap out of Overhaul and saved that little girl. He honestly couldn't do anything except... Overhaul is a dangerous man, Night Eye continued, his voice taking on a grim tone. He's a former member of the Yakuza, and he's been using his organization to manufacture and distribute these quirk-suppressing drugs. These drugs are unlike anything we've ever seen before. They are better than anything we have encountered so far, and they are getting better at making them. Ryukyu's eyes narrowed, and she folded her arms across her chest, her mind racing with the implications of such a weapon. Izuku also looked serious and worried. But more than anything, after seeing the image of Overhaul, he remembered who this person was. It was the same masked man he, Mirio, and Yuta had found before. How is he doing this? Night Eye's expression grew even more somber. This is where things get even more disturbing, he said. Overhaul isn't just using ordinary means to create these drugs, he's using his own daughter's DNA. The room fell into a stunned silence. For a moment, it felt as if time itself had stopped. The heroes exchanged shocked glances. Though Night Eye had put the words in a more subdued way, others could understand what the words really meant. After all, just saying torture doesn't express the true reality of torture to anyone. Only when someone goes through it do they understand its real meaning. And after hearing that the bastard was turning his own daughter's body into a weapon and selling them, daughter? Fat Gum's voice was filled with disbelief. You mean to tell me this guy is using his own kid to make these drugs? Hmm. Well, she is not really his daughter. She's more like the granddaughter of the previous head of the organization. But yeah, he is doing that, Night Eye clarified, though the situation remained the same no matter what. Night Eye nodded, his expression hardening. That little girl, Eri, possesses a quirk that allows her to reverse the state of anything she touches. Overhaul has been exploiting her quirk to produce these drugs, essentially using her as a living factory. Ryukyu slammed her hand down on the table, her dead, Ragon-like eyes flashing with anger. That's monstrous, she exclaimed. How could someone do that to their own child? Izuku's fists were clenched so tightly that his knuckles had turned white. We have to save her, he said, his voice trembling with emotion. We can't let her suffer like this but then a rhythmic beating spread through the room. Dum-dum-dum, dum-dum-dum-dum. Everyone knew about the owner of this particular heartbeat. They all slowly turned to Yuta, who was currently looking down at the table. No one knew what he was thinking. Yuta, on the other hand, was getting agitated upon hearing what he heard because he saw the girl's image and remembered that the girl was right in front of him. If it wasn't obvious already, it's worth mentioning that he has a soft spot for bullied kids, as his own childhood was almost ruined. So after knowing that a girl, almost like Rika and of the same age, was being used like that, he couldn't help but be agitated. Unknown to him, he was so excited that his king's engine activated. But this beating was unlike others. Usually, Yuta had a specific target when he used his king's engine, or he used it purely for power-up, and didn't bother using the conqueror-like effect of the skill. But right now, he didn't have a particular target, so the ability was going on a rampage. The heart started beating simply because he was too agitated, and due to the king's engine's suppressing abilities, which act much like conqueror's hockey. Other heroes, who were mostly pro-heroes, were feeling a pressure indescribable to them right now. Feeling a little pressure was normal when these beats started, but what they were feeling right now was not just mere pressure. Even Yuta didn't realize his emotions somewhat affected the output of the King's Engine. King's Engine, after all, was originally an intimidation power used by King. It's just that thanks to the system, Yuta can use it as a powerful tool. Using the system to activate King's Engine is one thing, but the powerful King's Engine's output when activated due to Yuta's emotional fluctuation was another thing altogether. A pressure so powerful that it almost knocked out those pro heroes descended on everyone. Dum 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 dum. To the heroes, it felt like time itself had stopped, and with every beat of Yuta's heart, the room itself was shaking. This, what is this? Why is this feeling of pressure so strong suddenly? Izuku's eyes widened, but his body was stiff. His own heart was beating fast, and for some reason, his body felt danger, putting itself in a fight-or-flight situation. 
He wasn't the only one. Other heroes were the same. They almost felt like they would lose consciousness if this continued for long. They were already feeling lightheaded, and their bodies were shaking with a feeling of dread. They all robotically turned their heads to Yuda, only to find that he didn't have any particular emotion on his face. Someone might even say he was completely calm, if not for the beats being his signature move, this dangerous pressure he was emitting, and finally, the little cracks forming on the table where he was sitting. Chapter 156, Hero Meeting 2, Yuta Calm Down Not being able to take it anymore, someone said with difficulty, making Yuta come out of his daze and immediately stop his king's engine. Sorry, I was just excited, that happens when I get like this, Yuta replied with a slightly subdued tone. He hadn't originally planned on participating in this so-called hero heist. After all, he had other things to worry about, namely finding the real identity of another little girl. But now he would be kicking Overhaul's ass, quest or no quest. He would make sure he punched him to kingdom come. Night Eye, who was sweating like the others due to the king's engine's effect, nodded with slight hesitation and difficulty to Yuda's apology and continued, we need to come up with a plan to take down Overhaul and his organization. But more importantly, we need to rescue Eri. She's the key to everything, and we can't leave her in Overhaul's hands any longer. The heroes returned to the topic, but internally they were glancing at Yuta. These heartbeats were able to suppress more than 15 pro heroes. I am glad that he is on our side. What the hell was that? I thought someone was holding me at gunpoint. So this is Yuta the boy who will be taking All Might's position. No wonder that old man retired, smart man. Sigh, why do I always get the problem, child? He is quite a character, at Toshinori. I finally understand why you stepped back. So much power in that tiny body, and if you're right, then a heroic spirit that rivals young Midoriya. But at the same time, lawless and not intending to take responsibility if Naitai has anything to say. Guiding this young man might indeed be more important for you than acting as a hero. Many of the heroes here had never personally met Dynamic and wanted to. For Yuta to be here was a chance for them to meet him, but they still maintained their professional behavior and decided to talk with him after the meeting. But this outburst brought the attention back to him. Yuta was famous, very famous actually, because of what he was capable of doing. Maybe he wouldn't have been so famous if All Might hadn't lost to the same villain Yuta killed just a few minutes ago. And then All Might went ahead and announced his retirement. Those events just hyped him up too much. Maybe even Yuta himself didn't realize what kind of position he was in right now. After that, each of them started to offer their thoughts and ideas on how best to approach the situation. Mirio suggested a coordinated strike on Shihasaikai's hideout, while Ryukyu emphasized the importance of gathering more intelligence before making any moves. What do you think, Dynamic? Night Eye finally asked, actually waiting to bring Yuta into the conversation, along with Gran Torino. Due to his conversation with Yuta, Night Eye now knew that Yuta wasn't interested in taking the symbol of peace position, which was an issue, though what Yuta was able to accomplish was a deterrent to the villains as long as he was a hero and stood on their side, that was only one side of the equation. There should be someone to give confidence to the people as well. Right now, public support for Yuta was so high that they were already calling him the next All Might. But that would decline with time, and after that, there would be no figure to hold the spotlight in the current generation. Maybe Yuta's own generation, as both Gran Torino and Night Eye glanced over at Izuku and Mirio for a second. But they lacked something crucial. Power. Compared to what Yuta has shown, even OFA at full power pales in comparison. People need that kind of power to give them hope and trust in heroes. That's why, if possible, they still wanted to put Yuta in that position. It was strange how, in the short term, they wanted people not to hype up Yuta too much because he was still young and needed time to take the number one position, but in the long term, they were actually worried that his reputation of being invincible would fade away and cause public distrust. Stranged, I'ms we live in, sigh. Both Night Eye and Gran Torino couldn't help but sigh to themselves. 
Blasting the front door open and raining down punches on those douchebags would have been my first choice if Aerie's safety weren't involved. Maybe I might have done that, but I have zero experience with rescue missions. I will go along with anything you old-timers come up with. Yuta replied while not paying much attention to what his words caused in others. Old-timers? Who is he calling old? Kid, I'm only 82 right now. Well, at least he agrees that a straightforward attack won't work this time. And there were many others who were thinking along the same lines. Why can't we just use your future sight to determine where they are and what they will do? Then we'll have an advantage, right? Someone asked Nighteye, to which Nighteye directly refused. Of course, there was a little argument about that, but ultimately the idea didn't pass. Nighteye finally said, after everyone had spoken and explained, Overhaul is dangerous, and his quirk gives him an edge in close combat. We can't afford to underestimate him. Remember that the safety of that little girl is more important than capturing Overhaul. To this, internally, Yuda just snorted. Who said he would be capturing that man? He wasn't a naive hero. He would kill when killing made sense. It's just that unlike when he directly killed AFO, here he would not let others know that he would deal with Overhaul. What about the drug? Yuta asked. If he's distributing it, we need to find out how far it's spread and whether there's a way to reverse its effects. Actually, Yuta was a little more worried about what would happen if a drug like that fell into the hands of someone like Shigaraki. And with his mind running wild, he also started to put things together. He wondered how that Nomu had such a powerful healing factor. Now maybe he knew why. Nighteye's expression grew grim. That's another issue we need to address. We don't know if the effects of the drug can be reversed, but we'll need to secure a sample and study it as soon as possible. That might be the only way to save anyone who's been affected. As the meeting continued, the heroes formulated a plan of action, each of them determined to see it through. After the meeting was done, Yuta was the first one to get out of the meeting room. One reason was that he realized others were waiting to waste his time after the meeting, so he decided to leave. But in reality, he just wasn't keen on going back to Rika. He had left her alone in his room. Though now he wasn't that worried about her getting lost since he had put a tracker on her long ago, he still didn't want to leave the girl alone in a room for that long.